Well, I want to thank Tony and thank the school for inviting me down to give this talk. I'm going to talk to you about a new, relatively new project related to a bigger research program where I try to explore the causes and consequences of the politicization of the bureaucracy. And I'll define what I mean by uh, politicization in a moment. Um, this is something that's ongoing in the best sense uh, for you probably, which means that you'll have questions for me that I might not be able to answer, but I'll do the best that I can. Um, so if there are questions of clarification or substance, please inter interrupt uh, as I'm going along. I think that makes it more fun for, for everybody. Uh, so the paper, in this paper I want to make two contributions to the general study of the administrative presidency uh, and politicization. The first is to explain why presidents target some agencies for politicizing type activities uh, and, some, uh, and some not. And then I also want to expand our conception and measure of this concept of politicization. So one of the great things about politicization is uh, it's current. Uh, relatively current now, but there is a sense in which we all have had some exposure to uh, the press or pundits or political observers talking about how the bureaucracy has been politicized in particular instances. So for example, uh, we might talk about the politicization of the Department of Justice where uh, political appointees in the Department of Justice uh, admitted that they had hired, fired, and promoted civil servants on the basis of their political views, something in violation of both civil service rule and law. Uh, they also, there was also stories that came out about how the White House was involved in removing U.S. attorneys, um, uh, sometimes because these U.S. attorneys weren't prosecuting certain kinds of cases aggressively enough in their view, and sometimes to make room for uh, uh, protégés of important uh, Republican officials. And an internal departmental probe of the Civil Rights Division within the USC found that uh, the head of that division, Bradley Schlozman, had uh, injected partisan politics into the day-to-day -day activities of the division. And so uh, these kinds of stories make this topic um, something that most people can kind of get their minds around, or at least it, it has some resonance with them. Uh, as political scientists, we tend to take these episodes, uh, expand them out, try to fit them into larger theories about why presidents do what they do, how this operates in practice, and what the effects are uh, for presidential control and also for <coughs> performance. So uh, the difficulty uh, for us as political scientists is to say, all right, this happens under Republican and Democratic administrations. It happens episodically in some places and not in others. So what explains uh, the variance? And so that's kind of the project that I'm engaged in here. Uh, and it continues some work that I've done uh, in previous work. OK, so what does this mean? What does politicization mean? It often has a, a, a pejorative connotation. And I want to suggest how that isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily need to be. Uh, the term often refers to the layering of political appointees on top of civil servants. So over here on the, the right, you get a, a, a picture of traditional civil service systems. So this is a generic type where federal employees or state employees or, or, or government employees in general enter at low levels, work their way up on the basis of merit, and, uh, uh, and they get increasing responsibility and pay based on how they do uh, on the basis of merit. At the top of these civil service systems are a layer of political appointees that are selected from outside the civil service generally. And uh, so the, the, what we often think of when we think of politicization is where is this line drawn between appointees and careerists? So when do we add more appointees on top or replace civil servants and put political appointees into their jobs and so forth? But the term has broader connotations in, co in common discourse, including the selection of these appointees only on the basis of loyalty as opposed to other criteria that we might uh, care about. It also involves sometimes the involvement of civil servants in political fights or uh, deciding policies and agencies explicitly on the basis of ideology more than evidence uh, or making appointment and promotion decisions in the civil service on the basis of political views as opposed to on the basis of merit. And in general, uh, the term refers to some sense of politics being injected into what we tend to think of as neutral administration. And we can argue about whether uh, that is a po that's even possible, but that's the general sense, is that somehow politics itself has been injected into uh, administration. Okay, so why is it sometimes a pejorative term and sometimes not? Well, uh, on the one hand, injecting politics into administration is democratic accountability. People are elected to make changes in government, and so injecting politics into administration, making agencies change what they do in response to election returns, that's democratic, that's, that's responsive. On the other hand, however, it has this pejorative connotation because there is some sense of the activities being illicit or 
uh, there's some concern about the effects that these kinds of actions can have on agency performance. Okay, so that's uh, the, the, the definition I'm going to be working from is uh, presidential intervention into a, a theoretically apolitical bureaucracy um, or the bureaucracy uh, in general. Okay, so what do we know about this topic in general? Well, there's lots of work going back even to the early republic that talks about the intervention of politics into bureaucracy, but the, the, the subject itself really got currency in the 70s and 80s with uh, discussions of uh, President Nixon's administrative presidency where he said, I'm having a difficult time getting uh, legislation enacted in Congress and so therefore I'm going to change my approach to policy making to getting control of the bureaucracy and changing bureaucracy and getting policy outputs that I want through administrative means as opposed to through legislation. And so with a variety of strategies, reorganization, impoundment, uh, control over personnel, the types of personnel that are selected, Nixon made a conscious effort to, to, to focus attention on administrative control. Okay, so uh, we get cases like that um, and other cases like, for example, the, sh the switch over from the Civil Service Commission to the Office of Personnel Management or other case studies like FEMA that illustrate or exhibit politicizing activity. Um, beyond the case studies in the literature, we get some more historical accounts that track, for example, the increased focus of presidents on loyalty as opposed to other factors, the development of the White House Personnel Office so that people can be selected more carefully according to certain criteria. Um, and so we get case studies, historical accounts of trends over time, and then we also get some more analytical, or, or I shouldn't say analytical, but we get more uh, systematic look at trends over time where we get things like increases in the number of appointees over time. Yep. Can you go back to slide? Sure. Who's that? That's Fred Mollick. Uh, Fred Mollick was the architect of uh, Nixon's administrative personnel strategy. Sorry. Yeah, um, so Moloch is great because he is the author, or at least the supervisor of the author of uh, something called the Moloch Manual, which uh, was a, uh, um, <clears throat> a revision of a government document that was given to appointees to show them how to get around civil servants that they didn't like. Uh, so for example, um, one of the, the anecdotes that they provide in this manual is you've got a transportation employee that is not doing the job that you want or isn't loyal to the president so how do you get them out of their job so you can put in somebody that you want and get around civil service rules and the answer was you tell this transportation uh, employee civil servant that you have a really important job for them to do and it involves surveying the transportation needs of all cities in the US under 30,000 people and so you're gonna go on the road and we want regular reports about the transportation needs of small towns all across the country and the idea being that that person's not going to like that job, they'll realize that they really ought to look for employment somewhere else, and then you have the opportunity to put in to that job uh, somebody that you prefer. So Moloch was involved in the administrative, particularly the personnel side of the, the administrative strategy in the Nixon administration. Thanks for that question. I should put an amendment there. Okay, so uh, additional work tracks some of these trends over time. And then more recently, there's been some work that tries to say um, where do, if, if presidents are going to politicize by adding more appointees, how does that happen? Do they go into liberal agencies, moderate agencies, conservative agencies, um, uh, and so forth? But that's pretty, that's pretty new. Uh, and the difficulty with this work is that it defines politicization pretty narrowly to be the number of appointees or how deep appointees penetrate into the bureaucracy. But when we talk about politicization more generally in common discourse, whether it's in the press or it's uh, on television, we tend to think of something broader than that. It's not the number of appointees, but somehow how the, that input politicization affects the outputs of the agency or the behavior day to day. So, for example, um, it doesn't, you know, what we're really talking about is, is politics somehow injected in a way it wasn't before in the day to day activities of uh, government? Okay, so where do presidents politicize? What should we expect theoretically for, uh, for this kind of behavior? If they're really concerned about the performance of particular agencies and getting control of it, what does that mean for their efforts to politicize? And so let me talk about presidents generically for a moment. So abstract away from the ways that they're different and think about the ways in which they have similar incentives across uh, both party and, uh, and time. Um, presidents are going to be held accountable for the performance of the whole government. I think arguably unfairly 
uh, people don't hold Congress as much accountable for uh, the failures of government or social problems that go unaddressed. They look to the president to be the lead in resolving those problems. And increasingly for presidents to be able to respond to those incentives, they have to control the administrative state, the bureaucracy, the 15 cabinet departments and 55 to 60 independent agencies. Um, so if we think about presidents from that perspective of trying to get control, uh, uh, we can get some, develop some expectations about which agencies are going to be most of concern to them and how they're going to target them. So let me uh, start with a few simple assumptions about presidential choices and then I'll uh, talk about what the implications of those assumptions are. So we'll start with some assumptions. You can agree or not agree with these assumptions and we can talk about what happens if you don't agree with these assumptions. But if you accept these assumptions at some simple level, some implications follow from those assumptions. So let me start with that. We'll get there and we can talk about whether uh, that's a reasonable way to characterize how presidents uh, behave. Okay, so the first one is I think pretty straightforward. We think presidents care about policy. Um, they either care about it because they care about it intrinsically, that's why they ran for office, that's why they got involved in politics in the first place, or we might think they care about policy because there are electoral consequences for not caring about it, that they need to do stuff to get reelected. So that's on this simple spatial setup here. If we think the president is P and the agency is A, they're just trying to move the agency closer to their position. So if a Republican president is elected and they're talking about environmental policy, they want the EPA to get more conservative, to rewrite regulations in such a way that it is more sensitive to the concerns of small business or businesses in general and uh, less regulatory in some sense. So that's the, the general sense there. And they have those views about other policies as well. So a Democratic president may prefer to uh, switch education policy away from No Child Left Behind uh, to some uh, education policy that's more sensitive to the concerns of um, teachers unions or, 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 or something of that nature. The second concept is a little bit trickier which is um, I assume that presidents want agencies to be good at what they do uh, and by that I mean if they set out to do something that they're effective at doing it. So think about it in the context of an agency like a budget <laughs> forecasting agency. You want budget forecasting agencies to hit their targets. You may want them to be systematically too optimistic or systematically too conservative, but you want them to do that consciously. If they're going to be over optimistic, you want them to know that that's where they're headed. And if you want them to be conservative, you, know that you want them to know that that's where they're headed as opposed to some kind of random um, you know, error in the forecast. Uh, so that's, um, so think of, that's what I mean when I, when, when I want them to be effective. So if a free market environmentalist in a Republican administration is going to get control of EPA, you want them to be able to write the regulations in such a way that you get exactly the outcome that you want, as opposed to write poor regulations, which might lead to more uncertainty. That's the, the, the sense here. Okay, um, agencies themselves have views about policy. That can be because people who like those agencies and their missions go to work there. It can be because Republicans and Democrats are distributed differently across the government. Some agencies have lots of Democrats, some have few. Um, or it can be just on the basis of what agencies do. Agencies that regulate or uh, have an inherently liberal, in some sense, mission that affects what we would say their ideology is. And the problem for presidents when they come into office is that they confront some agencies that are going to want to do what they want to do naturally without much direction. And some are going to, if they're left on autopilot, do something dramatically different than what presidents would otherwise have them do. Um, just based on the, the, the sort of policy views of the agency that would normally dictate their day-to-day -day activities. Okay, and then the fourth assumption here is that efforts to politicize, that is efforts of presidents to uh, inject politics into administration, um, hurt agency performance. Okay, and by that I mean um, reduce its capacity, lead them to make more mistakes, um, make it so that they can't respond to political direction if you want them to. Okay, and so the idea here, there, there are a number of reasons why this can be the case. It can be the case that when you inject politics in, people spend a lot more time doing politics than they do agency activities. It can be that when you inject politics in, the civil servants who are there who are getting overruled find less in their job that's attractive. And so it's hard to recruit and retain the very best people if all of the important policy decisions are being made by politicians as opposed to civil servants. So there are a number of reasons why uh, we might think that this kind of activity hurts agencies and hurts their capacity. Yeah, Dan? I will follow this, but I want to come back at some point because it seems to me that that's a conscious strategy by some presidents to make sure things don't get done. And that's not reducing competency, that's actually getting them closer to their values. Yeah. So that would be the, 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 the argument that maybe what presidents want to do is they want to slow things down. Sometimes. Yeah. And 
Um, so I, I guess I would say two things about that, uh, which is um, it's not entirely, so I, I, I know there are historical cases where this is true, so I think that's absolutely right. As a, pra as a sort of general matter, the question is, would presidents want agencies to fail? Would you want to disable them in some way? Well, in some cases, like the Nixon administration, there were cases where their goal was to set up to break things up and to, to, uh, to make them work less effectively. Um, when I talked to personnel officials, uh, about this, and I said, you know, so these are Republican personnel officials. You know, what's your view about EPA? Did you want to, you know, if you had a choice between a free market environmentalist, somebody who would come in and rewrite rules that would reset regulation um, or roll back regulation, go through the rulemaking process and actually do things differently, um, or put in somebody that was just going to sort of slow things down, reduce enforcement, cut the budget, these kinds of things, which would you prefer? And the answer that the, the, the Republican personnel official gave me was interesting. She said, well, I think in, our preference would be to have a sort of really good free market environmentalist in there, except for the fact that we might lose elections. Um, so there are, um, you know, but that choice is a real one. That is, you want somebody really good, if, you're, if you want to stop an agency from doing something, do you want somebody really good in there who uh, will change policy the way that you want, or do you want to just sort of break it down in some way uh, in the long run? And I think they choose either one in some cases. If it's true that agencies want, or if presidents want to stop agencies from working by hurting them, um, then what you get is you should see a lot more politicization in those cases. That's sort of the, the, the big picture. If presidents want to stop agencies from doing something by politicizing and they, they want to reduce capacity, you, what the, the end result then is you should see more of this politicizing type activity with fewer constraints. Okay, so what are the implications then? Well, I think they're, they're in some ways intuitive given what we've talked about so far. So um, uh, at least the first one is pretty straightforward. That is, if presidents come in and an agency has different views about what policy should be than they do, they're going to want to politicize more. That is, they're going to want to get control of the agency, uh, inject their DNA into the day-to-day -day operations of the agency, and get that agency to kind of re, uh, to write the ship or come closer to their own views about um, what policy should be, uh, and that's going to vary across the government. Uh, so if you're if you're Reagan and you come in, you're concerned about social welfare and regulatory agencies. If you're uh, Clinton and you come in, you're worried about defense. You may be worried about commerce or treasury, uh, because those agencies have more Republicans that work there. They've worked closely with the previous Republican administrations, and so you may t be more attentive there than you would be to social welfare uh, and regulatory agencies. Okay, the second, and I'll just say, there's a component of this too, which is, um, there's an agenda component to this too, which is presidents have to care about some policies more than others, right? So there's, when personnel officials talk about priorities, they think, we need to change policy, but we can't change everything at one time, so we prioritize some things more than others. And that's going to sort of work its way in here as well in a minute. Okay, the second prediction is a little bit more subtle, and it, it, it's, um, uh, so let me spend a little bit of time on it. Um, some agencies can be politicized and it's not going to affect performance that much. So think about an agency whose job it is to send out checks. Um, if you put a bunch of appointees in, if they inject politics into the day-to-day -day activities of what that agency is doing, can you still send out checks on time? You probably can. Appointees and careerists can probably do that job as well. Uh, there's not a big performance gap between those two groups. Um, it's a pretty simple task in some ways relative to other things that government does. And so if that's the case, if you can dump appointees in, change policy, but not really affect how good the agency is at its job, then you're going to politicize more. If, on the other hand, some small change in policy, some one additional appointee or um, some more direct White House involvement or some explicit consideration of partisan factors in an agency. In some agencies where that happens, so think like Bureau of Labor Statistics or some very professionalized agency, you can really mess things up, right? You can, so, or, or even the CIA, you dump in a bunch of appointees from Congress to run CIA and the top 20 career professionals in CIA say, I'm done, I'm out of here. And then what you've done is you've lost a, ton, a, a, a tremendous amount of human capital in a way that could really affect the performance of the agency. And so the, the gist of this prediction is if what an agency does is relatively insensitive to increased efforts at political control, you're going to get more politicization there. If an agency is really, really sensitive to political intervention, 
um, then you're going to get less politicization there. And I'll talk about that uh, more as we proceed. Okay, the last one is just that, and this is also relatively straightforward, Congress and the President are going to have different views about political control. When Congress and the President share the same views about policy, they're willing to make the same trade-offs between control and performance, and Congress is going to be on board. They're going to say, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if you're a Democrat, you think, I want President Obama to have as much control as possible, and I'm happy to let him use that control to get these agencies to turn around what they're doing, to get control of the SEC, to get control of Treasury, to get control of EPA, to get control of education. You're perfectly willing to let that happen. Um, if, uh, by contrast, you don't think that President Obama is going to change policy the way that you want, or if you're a Democrat in a Republican administration, you're going to think, I don't want the Republican president to change policy as much as they want, then you're going to get more resistance. Um, this is something I can't test with the data that I'm going to... I'm going to show you, but I think it's a natural implication of the theoretical setup from before. So Congress does actively constrain more when they don't share the views of the president. Unified government and divided government are very different in how this operates uh, historically. Okay, so how do you test something like this? How do you measure this concept? How do you find out, in fact, where which agencies are politicized and which ones are not? Uh, with uh, with Tony and another colleague, we uh, put a survey into the field, the federal, uh, survey, of federal, uh, fu survey on the future of government service. We surveyed the top 7,000 executives in the federal government. So this is people from cabinet secretaries down to about the deputy bureau chief level. So it's a mixture of Senate confirmed appointees uh, and senior executive service members. And these are the people who were surveyed. So it's careerists and it's senior executives. We're going to I'm going to focus on the careerist today. About a third of the people that we surveyed responded to the survey. Uh, and we asked them a variety of questions about their backgrounds, about their work environment, about their politics, stuff that federal government surveys can't generally ask them yet. What was the response rate of the, uh, <coughs> the appointees versus the careerists? The response rate of the appointees was about 20%. So it was, it was lower. It was so bigger, more senior, the less lower response. Yeah, I f um, because of IRB restrictions, I can't tell you exactly who responded and who didn't, but you can make inferences about who you think was likely to respond and who was not. Yeah. Um, so we feel relatively confident that the sample of careerists that responded was relatively representative of the population of careerists that we cared about. We're less confident that that's true for the appointees, which is partly why here I'll talk about the survey responses of the careerists relative to the, instead of the appointees. Okay. Um, one other thing here is you might be concerned that it's only disgruntled Democrats that are responding to the survey at the end of the Bush administration, right? So this is a survey that takes some time and maybe it's only people have something to say that are going to respond. And so we were concerned about that. So what we did was we hired a firm. Um, this is a little d unsettling for, uh, for, for once you hear about it. But what we did is we hired a firm to match. We knew, we knew people's names and we knew where they worked. And so the firm could find home addresses for people with unique names where you knew where they worked. So you could identify a, a relatively large proportion of the population um, based on unique names and where they worked. And then once you know where they work, you can buy information about voter registration and a ton of consumer information. So for the population, you can find out um, whether they voted, what primary they voted in, you can find out whether they own their home, the size of their mortgage, how many children they have, what kinds of magazines they subscribe to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and we didn't use that information for nefarious purposes. What we did was we said, let's look at the proportion of people who vote in the Democratic primary and the Republican primary and see whether it matches up with the self-reported partisan identification of the respondents to the survey. And it does match up relatively well. So our purpose was to say, does this sample that responded to the survey look like the population as a whole? And the answer is, at least in partisanship, yes, they look like, they look like who we thought they, they so were supposed to be. Don't you have a survivorship bias issue? I mean, aren't the Democrats who are really disgusted going to be long gone from the civil service? Yeah. Like yeah. Um, that's one of the limitations of the survey is it happens at one point in time. And what happens in year seven or year eight of an administration is going to be different than what happens early on. So with that caveat moving forward, absolutely yes. The only reason I read it, I, I, just as it happens, I know a lot of people who are in the civil service 
who managed to get through the Reagan and Bush senior administrations just fine. And Bush Jr., they, mm. they couldn't hit the so. mm. mm. there seem I mean, that's anecdotal, of course, but it's a note. It's probably half a dozen people. Like how many people do want to know? So yeah. it's really, it was really striking. Yeah, and I think my concern. Yeah, if I were to, you know, in terms of the inferences that are to come, I guess the question would be, um, is it going to change the levels of reported politicization in some way? Or So I guess I'd like to, I'll have to keep thinking about what does that mean for the sort of analysis that's coming if across the government there are fewer liberals or fewer people who oppose the administration. That'll change the level, but will change the... Um, the effects of the analysis, does this factor affect this factor? Um, so let me, I'll try to keep that in my mind, but if you see something like that here in a way that affects the inference, let me know. Okay. Okay, so here's uh, how we measure this concept, politicization, or here's how I measure it. Um, so please indicate the, your level of agreement or disagreement with each of the following statements about your job and work setting. Uh, so the first is, policy decisions concerning my agency are based upon evidence rather than ideological beliefs. Uh, this one is, among career managers in my agency, I have a pretty good idea of who's a Democrat and who's a Republican. Um, in my agency, the policy or political views of career professionals at the GS-12 to GS-15 level influences their chances for promotion or attractive assignments. Okay, and then these things will be recoded so that higher values indicate more politicization. Okay, so just to give you a flavor about the variation across the government, so what this means is um, so here's ideology versus evidence. So in the Education Department, the National Labor Relations Board, the General Services Administration, Veterans Health Administration, Labor, you get more civil service respondents saying decisions in my agency are made on the basis of ideology as opposed to evidence. So that's what that means. Well, who, my funders are on the side. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, I have yeah, sure. The GS-12, GS-13, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So in the um, federal civil service, at the very top are Senate-confirmed appointees. Below them is kind of a middle level of managers in something called the Senior Executive Service, which is a mix of appointees and career professionals. And then below them is the normal civil service. And GS-12 and GS-15 is an indicator of pay grade, which is also highly correlated with how, where you are in the hierarchy. So it's the people who are right below that middle level of top management. Well, so higher numbers are more politicized. Yeah, yeah. I re Why would it be true of GSA? Isn't GSA one of those check writing outfits as opposed to, you know, DOT down here or yeah. DOJ? Yeah, uh, so my story with GSA is the following. So one of the great episodes in the last administration, great f if you're sort of a political junkie, is that Carl Rove sent out a team to do these PowerPoint presentations in different agencies. and. One of the places where it happened was in the General Services Administration, where Loretta Doan, who was the head of GSA, basically said, how can we, you know, basically, how can we use the resources of government, our contracting, our buildings, our, uh, our um, uh, automobile fleet, to help our vulnerable Republicans? Um, so there was a pretty public way in which politics was injected even into GSA, which is really a distributive it distributes out lots of government money in contracts in uh, uh, you know, public buildings and you know, buying goods and services for the federal government. Yeah. Could you go back to the, uh, the questions that you were sure. asking? Mm -hmm. uh, GS-15 is a pretty sophisticated individual. Mm -hmm. to to <coughs> is there any determination on how much this is socially accepted responses? Because if I'm a GS-15 and I get a question saying, are based upon evidence within ideological beliefs, even if I believe that they're based on ideological beliefs, <coughs> they answer evidence. Uh, right, so there might be some fear that somebody would find out. Or is your concern that they would not be truthful because of fear of retaliation or um, misperceive things in some way? Well, Retaliation at the extreme, but at the same time, being exiled to visit every town under thirty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's it, I can't rule that out that they would not answer truthfully because it's a because it's a survey. Except that we bent over backwards to 
explain to them that confidentiality would be protected and the means by which it would be protected, which was to more or less say, um, your personal information and your responses will be kept in separate files, never joined together on um, secure servers. Now, that's, I don't know whether that's protection enough. And there were some cases where a civil servant said, there's no way I'm going to answer a survey, particularly electronically, where I give my political views. So it's conceivable that there is some, at least in terms of the levels, under-reporting of their true opinion here about how much politics is involved in promotion decisions. So I think that's a fair, a fair concern. The question is, I guess, is, is that under-reporting across the board or does it vary agency to agency? Um, and it may, but you're absolutely right that that's a, that's a concern. But you'll see actually that the levels that say that it's politics you know, is low. So does that mean it doesn't happen because it's illegal or does it happen and I'm just afraid to report it because I could be, there could be retribution? Okay, this is, uh, do career managers uh, know the partisanship of their colleagues? The high end here, EPA, National Institutes of Health, Health and Human Services, Education, Veterans Health Administration again, Labor, NASA, State, Interior. On the low end are independent commissions like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Federal Trade Commission. Other here is a bunch of small agencies, so things like um, American Battle, Mon Battle Monuments Commission and so forth, and then NLRB and the archives. Here's the, the, the question we were just talking about. So, um, do the policy and political views of career professionals influence their chances of promotion? On the high end are Veterans Health State, part of agriculture, Air Force, FAA, um, and so forth. All right, there's one last measure of politicization, and that is, in general, how much influence do the following groups have over policy decisions in your agency? And this is just a measure of the extent to which they think the White House has a great deal, good bit, some, little, or none in terms of its influence on agency uh, decisions. Okay, so places where they think that the White House has a lot of influence are state, education, EPA, NASA, Homeland Security, Interior, Navy, and Air Force. Low are the independent commissions, not surprisingly, and these small agencies where presidents probably aren't paying a lot of attention. Okay, so are there any general patterns here before we get to the more involved analysis? Um, in general, we get um, State Department, which is you know, sort of essential for foreign policy, and then we get two agencies that are generally, we would consider to be liberal, EPA and the Education Department, and then the VA is a tough one. All right, so this is in the midst of the Walter Reed scandal, and so I wonder whether there is some sense in which the full weight of the White House is being brought down in the Veterans Health Administration to straighten out problems there. Um, but I wouldn't otherwise have characterized VA as a place where I would expect lots of political influence. In terms of the least politicized, we have two independent commissions. We have these other small agencies and then Treasury, um, which is a little bit odd except that there were huge numbers of vacancies in Treasury for a significant portion of the Bush administration. And so it may be that there just isn't much political, uh, there's not a lot of political presence there relative to other administrations. Well, but that's different right now. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> okay, so how do you know whether an agency is liberal or conservative? Uh, and the answer to that question is it's really hard. Um, you could, um, so here's the way we, I try to characterize agencies as liberal or conservative. Uh, I sent out an expert survey to uh, people who study bureaucratic politics, who write on uh, administrative affairs, so think tank people, journalists, and academics. I asked them to characterize these agencies as um, leaning liberal, leaning conservative, neither consistently or don't know over the time period prior to when the survey went into the field and then use those answers to generate estimates of the liberalism or conservatism of these different agencies. And then I can characterize them as being, you know, in the liberal category, in the conservative category, or the moderate category. And the reason why I did this was that I started out doing, I think, what we would all probably do, which is say, okay, which agencies do I think are liberal? Um, well, EPA and, um, you know, HUD. Um, yeah, D, uh, HHS, exactly. And then I said, well, which ones are conservative? And I could come up with a couple, DOD, maybe Treasury. And then I thought, 
Yeah, yeah, all the ser military services. And then I thought, but why not, why just rely on my own judgment about this? Let's ask a bunch of people and aggregate the information and see that would be more reliable than me just doing it in an ad hoc way. And so that was the, the motivation here. Okay, and so here's just a, a quick look. If we just divide up averages uh, in terms of the responses to these questions based on whether agencies are liberal, dark blue, or conservative, light blue, you tend to see that the liberal agencies, so this is the Bush administration, the, liberal agent, the respondents in the liberal agencies are more likely to respond that there is the presence of politicization in their agency, or at least what we think are indicators of politicization in their agency. So this is, again, just a, a quick bivariate look. Let's compare averages. Let's break up the agencies by ideology and see whether there's any difference systematically. Um, the smallest difference is in the civil service violations um, question, and it may be for the reasons that we talked about, that they're a little bit more hesitant to talk about what's illegal activity um, <coughs> for the reasons that we suggested. <coughs> okay, so how do you tell whether an agency is on the president's agenda? Uh, so to measure this concept, I just used uh, the State of the Union addresses and a New York Times review <coughs> of the president's agenda. Uh, and said, here are the issues, here are the agencies that match up with those issues. If they're mentioned in the State of the Union, if an issue that they carry out is mentioned in the State of the Union or in this New York Times review um, right before the State of the Union, uh, then I'll consider that agency on the President's agenda. Otherwise, we'll consider it to be off. So it's a pretty stark break there. And then this one's a little tricky. So remember, this is this idea that we're, we care about the marginal influence of politicization on agency performance. And so how do you tell what the marginal effect of a politicizing activity is on how well the agency is going to function. And what I decided was agencies with complex tasks, things that are doing, agencies doing rock and science are doing, um, you know, complex, estimating complex econometric models. Um, if that agencies with more complex tasks are going to be more likely to be sensitive to these politicizing activities than other kinds of agencies. And so it's an indirect way to get at this idea. And so um, there are two measures here. One is the proportion of scientists, mathematicians, architects, engineers in the agency as a proportion of the total number of employees. And the second is the proportion of an agency's programs. If we look at all of their programs, the proportion that are research and development programs. These are admittedly um, unsatisfactory measures in some way, but I just, it's one of these concepts that I understand the concept, but it's hard to find an appropriate measure. Um, and so we'll see what that looks like when we estimate the models. Okay, since it's a survey, there's, uh, there's some respondent-specific and agency-specific controls. Yeah? I was going to ask, how do you handle it when agencies have kind of uh, overlapping responsibilities? So the Department of Human Services mm -hmm. is health, but if you're talking about veterans, if you're talking about criminals, the Department of Justice, the VA comes in. And so how did you handle that? Yeah. In those cases, both of them would be concluded, included as an agenda agency. Okay, so then I estimate a model of the responses. So what I'm trying to do is predict the probability that a respondent says, I strongly agree that this is going on in my agency or I agree that this is going on in my agency. And so the models are set up that way. So the unit of analysis is, an, is a particular respondent and their particular response to a question about politicization. Um, and then here's what we get. So I'll just show you um, some pictures here. I mean, let me talk about the substantive effects as well. Okay, so the first, uh, the first conclusion here is that, and this is robust to lots of different ways of looking at this. I could try to beat it up as many ways as I can, but this just shows up consistently across the board, which is that agencies, um, the more conservative an agency is, the less politicized it is um, in the Bush administration. So it's this sense that presidents are targeting agencies that are perceived to be liberal for more politicizing activity. That's the, that's the, the conclusion here. And so you can see the estimates there. Um, let me give you a, a sense substantively. So if we increase an agency's conservatism from one standard deviation below the mean level to one standard deviation above the mean level, um, the chances that a respondent will report politicization increase or, or decrease by 9, 20, 3, and 13 percentage points. So that's, they're that percentage point less likely to say politicization is happening in my agency. Um, so let me take a concrete example. So uh, we'll take the Department of uh, Labor and Commerce. So this agency is created in 1903. 
as one agency, right? It's a nice political bargain. You get labor and commerce. It gets split up into two agencies in 1913. So we have labor and we have commerce. Uh, labor begins to get a reputation as being liberal because it's closely connected with unions. Commerce begins to get a reputation for being uh, conservative because of its uh, efforts to expand business opportunities in the, in the United States. Um, if we just compare those two agencies and said, what if the Department of Commerce looked like the Department of Labor? Um, what would that mean for the way that respondents uh, answered these questions? Um, if the Department of Commerce looked like the Department of Labor in terms of its ideological profile, the chances that a respondent would agree or strongly agree with one of these statements about politicization increase by 11, 23, 3, and 15 percentage points. So that means, in concrete terms, there are 23 percentage points more likely to say, among career managers in my agency, I have a good idea who's a Republican and who's a Democrat. Um, there are 15 percentage points more likely to say, um, uh, the White House had a good bit or a great deal of influence over policy decisions in my agency. And so again, this is controlling for the respondent's own ideology. This is just some uh, outside measure of whether these agencies are liberal or conservative. Um, that's what you see. So liberal and conservative uh, there seems to matter. Um, in terms of um, just seeing that there, you can see the effects there. Uh, in terms of the agenda, are agencies on the agenda more likely to be politicized? Well, yes, to some extent. So um, the coefficients in a couple of the cases are large and statistically distinguishable from zero. In other cases, they're um, a little bit smaller and, and less harder to say that they have no effect at all. Um, substantively, if, if an agency is mentioned in the State of the Union or something it does is mentioned in the State of the Union, um, the chances that the, it, it, the respondent says it's politicized um, increase by about three to four percentage points, um, and in these cases, uh, up to 10 percentage points. So it's an effect, but it's not, it's not huge. And then finally, on this last, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the, I'm reporting the, 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 the third line is the second line. Um, on the, the sensitivity of agency performance to politicization, um, that's there as well. Um, the coefficient estimates are significant to the models, but, but again, substantively, the effects are relatively uh, modest. Um, so we're talking in the range of, you know, a standard deviation increase leads to three or four percentage points more likely to say, yeah, politicization isn't going on here. Um, okay, so what's the, what's the big picture here uh, in terms of the estimates? Well, um, if we look at the federal government and we're trying to say, okay, which of these agencies on this map are going to get politicized, uh, we would say agencies with different preferences than those of the president. That's pretty robust. I feel r pretty confident about that. Um, I would also say that agencies on the agenda, there's g generally a sense that they're going to be targeted more and respondents are going to recognize that there's more White House influence and that there's more politics there. Um, agencies' performance that is unlikely to be hurt by this activity, some evidence, but it's, it's just, it's, it's, you know, there's a hint there, but it's really not um, something that I would change policy on the basis of. Okay, so um, presidents politicized predictably in, predict in predictable places is what I would say. Um, and we see evidence of that with these new measures. And I would just say, um, this is one administration at the end of the administration, so it's hard to generalize with much confidence to other presidencies, so it needs to be expanded. Um, but I'd also say this is politicization that, that occurs for one motivation. That's to get control. It's not politicization that occurs because I want to reward somebody with a job that worked on my campaign or gave me a lot of money. And so that's kind of a separate question than what's being addressed here. So these are you know, a list of, of donors. Um, so that's, that's the work. And it's uh, hopefully interesting. And, but clearly, you know, it, the, the, the data are supportive in some cases and less supportive in other cases. Well, I have a, just a, a simple-minded question. If you've studied this a lot, and this, I, I, you must have an opinion, but I didn't quite hear it. To what extent, I mean, do you feel that this is um, an important issue just generally? I mean, you, you were looking at one, so, so not really just based on your study specifically, but mm -hmm. given the fact that I presume that you're, you, you spend a lot of time in this. I mean, is this 
uh, issue of politicization of uh, these appointees? Is it is it perceived? Do you do you consider this to be a a significant problem? And mm -hmm. if if so, what um, <coughs> based either on your research or, or just other other thinking you might have, what do you think uh, might or ought to be done about it? Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a good question. So the other part of the research is it, that I've been engaged in is to try to figure out, well, does this matter for anything concrete? Is there a systematic effect to this for performance, for example? And the motivation for that research was Hurricane Katrina. So why is it that FEMA responds so poorly in response to Hurricane Katrina? Does it have something to do with Michael Brown and how he got into this job? Or the fact that FEMA has uh, two to three times as many political appointees as other agencies its size, and none of them have emergency management experience? Um, and the answer to that question I found is yes, I think it matters systematically when there are lots of appointees and when those appointees don't have the characteristics that make them equipped for the, for the job which they've been appointed. Um, so let me, I, I think I have a picture in here that gives you a flavor of what this work looks like. So um, here is a, th these are histograms of performance scores for federal programs. So a higher number there means you're doing better. A lower number there means the program is doing poorly. And it's just broken up by um, careerists, so programs that are run by careerists, and then programs that are run by appointees from the campaign, and then appointees that are not from the campaign. And this is a, there's more sophisticated analysis behind this. This is just a simple look. But what it, you can see, there's sort of this illustration here, which is programs run by appointees get systematically lower program evaluations than programs run by careerists. And that's particularly the case when programs are run by appointees from the campaign. Um, and for me, that's systematic evidence that these efforts have costs. Now, we may be willing to pay those costs if what we get in exchange is more democratic accountability, but you can't hardly get democratic accountability or more presidential injection of their views in without some, some cost. And the cost often is in management quality. But I wonder if, to some extent, this might be reflecting the fact that I mean, we're all sort of professionally minded people and tend to focus on competency, et cetera, and things like that. So we're kind of skewed towards thinking of this as being the, uh, the relevant benchmark. But if, yeah. in fact, I'm a, an ideologically driven president and I've just received a, uh, sufficient votes from across the country to put me in the office of the presidents of the United States, and, I'm, and if I view the world in ideological terms, then this stuff is bunk. If, to me, yeah. if if it's if these if these careerists are in fact uh, doing things that are not uh, ideologically uh, consistent, so mm -hmm. it's so I'm not sure what we prove by this, other than well we're on this side and you know we're we're sort of the professionalists over here, and and then there are the ideologues over there. Yeah, I mean I think that the the sort of root of your comment is the following, which is that. Whether you think this is good or bad depends on whether you have the same views as the president or not, right? That is, if you think what the president is doing by politicizing is making the agency do what you want it to do, you think this is a pretty good activity. You might even say it's going to hurt performance in some ways, but I'm willing to make that trade off in the same way that the president is. If you don't share the president's views, then you think I'm concerned about the effects of this on performance and I'm concerned that what they're doing is they're changing policy in a direction that is not consistent with the way that I think the agency should be behaving. So there is a sense in which where you stand, in, or where you sit in the process depends on where you, st will, will determine where you stand on whether this is a good or a bad thing. Now I would personally say that um, uh, presidents tend to prefer more politicization than most other actors in the political process because they're the ones that benefit from it immediately, particularly when it helps them with patronage in a way that the public really doesn't care. So I would say they prefer more systematically than the, than the public and certainly more systematically than Congress um, in most cases, or at least the median in Congress. It's funny that it struck me as your, your relationship between the conservatism of the agency and whether they said um, evidence versus ideology influence mm -hmm. policy. And of course, it, it's not that it's some objective measure of influence versus, I, I'm sorry, ideology versus evidence. It's whether people said yeah. It, so I, I am absolutely convinced that the evidence for the existence of global warming is overwhelming. Yeah. 
I'm sure there are people in the administration, <coughs> administration people outside the Bush administration, who would tell me, no, you're an, you're an environmentalist, ideologue, tree-hugging yeah. person, and you're not looking at the data the right way. Mm -hmm. When you see a hockey stick, I see white noise. And so you're the ideologue, and I have the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so that result might reflect just what people perceive, people in the agencies perceive evidence to be relative to ideology as opposed to yeah. some objective view of we're making decisions based on yeah. evidence. I mean, ideology. that question is in some ways, it's, it is a loaded question in some way. But I shared your concern about that issue specifically, which is why I tried in the, um, in the uh, in the controls here to do the best I could with it, which is let's control for whether somebody themselves is a liberal or a conservative, and hopefully that controls the extent to which their perceptions are influencing what's true or what's just perception. And, that, and I think that helps. So I was thinking about that, and I think that helps. But think about it. you're in the DOD, okay, and you're a liberal in DOD, and you're thinking are there weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? But probably that culture that you're sitting in every day yeah. makes you go. Yeah, there, the evidence is overwhelming. There were weapons of mass destruction. I mean, it could, mm -hmm. right? So you're not. It's just an, it's just yeah. an interpretation yeah, yeah. question. Right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, um, I, I share the concern that this is more an issue of, you know, sort of perception and personal ideology, maybe influenced by your own views or the environment that you work in. Um, I think that's a fair, that's a, a fair concern. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Sam Park. I'm here for research after earning my PhD at Seoul National University last year, and my dissertation is about the determinants of political <coughs> in Korea. And I have to say this because uh, uh, your papers and books were very helpful to develop my ideas, and I uh, say I enjoyed your presentation very much. And I have two questions. One is that uh, I wonder if. It, it, there, is there any possibility for president to see any resistance or opposition from agencies? Because you said uh, it is, because in Korea it is uh, patron uh, politicization for patronage is more more prevalent mm -hmm. than for uh, politicization for policy. Mm -hmm. And and I also curious whether the politicization could occur due to. The, the demand from the agencies, because uh, political, <coughs> appointment political appointments are uh, often co-opted by agencies in Korea. And the another question is, uh, is it possible for presidents to politicize for policy, I mean, uh, in a timely manner? Because I, I found that the nomination and confirmation process in the White House is very slow mm -hmm. and long so and and it could be frustrating for presidents and also for the candidates mm -hmm. and so and it could be worse if there is any disagreement between presidents and congress so i'm wondering your thoughts on this matter yeah well it is true that um the amount of politicization is lower during periods when congress and the president don't share the same views so it's certainly true that congress constrains um, um, in terms of the, 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 the delay in the confirmation process, um, the limited evidence we have, so presidents have a number of possibilities when they come in to get the policy outcomes they want. They can centralize control in the White House and increase the number of czars and make policy decisions there and drive policy from the White House, or they can push appointees out into the bureaucracy. And in some ways, um, those two strategies um, are different ones and the limited evidence we have is that presidents tend to um, rely more on their appointees after their teams are in place. That is, it takes a little while to get your team in place so at first you rely on everybody in the White House then once your team is in place then you're really that's when you're really aggressively trying to change policy in the agency. So there is a lag um, but the latest evidence we have is that Senate confirmed positions are vacant um, often about a quarter of the time. And so at least at the, not the top levels, but at the sort of lower levels. And that does raise this question of how effective is this strategy. Um, so I think it's a, it's a good one. But the president, but it's intertwined with these other choices presidents have about how to influence policy. Um. Wonder, um, so you have one big mention about the uh, 
whether the agency is sensitive, the sensitivity of performance to productization. So I was wondering, some of those are usual categories about the types of agencies mm -hmm. you talk about, whether yeah. it's client, service, or yeah. you know, those low E or Wilson yep. typology. Would, yep. would those be legitimate control to look at? Since some agencies are in, inherently more po politicized because of the nature of the constituencies that might drive much of the results, would that be a possibility? Um, so the question is whether the typology of the those agencies, I mean, some are more embedded with the client growth and some are more general distributive. I see. So regulatory, distributive, yeah. redistributive. Yeah. Low e, sure. Typology, James Q. Wilson, typology. <coughs> Would those be the main explanatory variables? I think those may influence the levels of politicization, but I don't think they would. I'm trying to see a direct connection between those categorizations and the marginal effect of politicization on their performance, unless you think that there is. So I guess your point would be there's a systematic difference between distributive, redistributive, and regulatory in terms of how those behaviors would be affected by politicizing. Because obviously, some agencies are, are facing a more politicized environment, political yeah. environment. Sure. So then the president wants to, whatever game points will be popular, they have to deal with those kind of popular demands more and often than other types of agency that are only writing technical <coughs> so, so those could be sort of the permanent <coughs> would, would, would be quite important regardless of who, who the president is. OK, yeah, thanks for that suggestion. Um, two somewhat related concerns, but they, they both have to do with the dollar since we've been mm -hmm. talking about it all morning. So, <coughs> I wonder about both the agenda measures and the preference divergence measures, and let me give you an example, mm -hmm. right? So <coughs> the ideology versus evidence question, mm -hmm. right? <coughs> Might it not be the case that the reason why, I, the reason why an agency became so conservative is because ideology started to replace evidence as a result of politicization efforts, right? Um, and the same thing, the same thing goes with the other kinds of with the other kinds of measures, right? And particularly the first two questions, the ideology versus evidence and the no Republicans and Democrats in the civil service. Right? So ideology becomes um, transparent in these agencies in part because of politicization efforts, right? We're looking at a cross section, so over the long run, since the Nixon administration, for example, these kinds of trends have, have occurred. The, the president's agenda one, the one that, that most concerns me there is the dependent variable is White House influence yeah. mm -hmm. and mention in the president's State of the Union perhaps the only reason why fair we would target those agencies. Right? Yeah, fair enough. So help me think about the first one. Um, okay. So the, in terms of the president's agenda one, um, there is another way to get around that, which is find cases where agencies enter the president's agenda exogenously, yes. right? So, and then you can identify those agencies and compare, you know, whether there's a systematic difference there. And so that's, yes. you know, I think supplements this analysis with that. Exactly. On the agency conservatism one, help me think about that. So, um, so these are measures of agency ideology in the period prior to the survey. Okay. So these are sort of pre-existing conservative or liberal agencies. And um, they're not they're necessarily pre-existing right? because you did ask, I mean, they're, they're pre-existing in terms of when you publish them, right? They're not necessarily. Empty. They're before 2007, right? before so, the survey is asked. Right, exactly. Yeah. So if these, if these things changed, you know, tremendously, right? But since we're looking at sort of long run trends, right, in these cross-sectional data, um, I still, that's where my concern is. Right, yeah, I mean, my, the, the reason I asked this survey, the agency ideology question, the way that I did was to try to get people's assessments across both Republican and Democratic presidents mm -hmm. so that there was a sense which they were taking a long-term view, not sensitive to those short-term moves in a liberal or a conservative direction right. um, so that it wouldn't be subject to that kind of concern. Right. And that's why I don't use measures of agency conservatism based on the self-identification of the bureaucrats who are there because that could be caused by the same factors that explain politicization. Right, exactly. I think that's a much stronger explanation than okay. just saying that they're analytically prior. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think. I, I, 
I'm, I'm struggling with the uh, thing about earlier, which is the competency issue. Sure. And, and I realize, uh, I appreciate what you're doing right now, but I, I've taken down a little different path. I was trying to think what the anchor for this analysis is. And, and I, is this deviation from some past behavior that is caused by a president? Deviation from some past behavior. Or you start out saying that they're at some place and a president tries to do something to move them to some other place. Yeah, yeah. But, but when in fact you talked about confidence, I'm wondering if you, if you could look at the question of a president's attempt to make them more responsive to some purpose. In other words, uh, to bear with, with bringing the confidence in. What if a president's mm -hmm. action is because the president believes they are not competent given their mission? That's a very different way of looking at the president's uh, motives. Yeah. Can you spin that out for me a little bit more, Dan? Sure. Too? The, uh, the president of the United States today comes into office and he believes that if you read the, the NEPA uh, passed mm -hmm. way back when by some of the Chinese Nixon, mm -hmm. uh, that in the past administration it was pulled from its purpose mm -hmm. some way. Mm -hmm. And that he's not really trying to influence the way you suggested for his own purposes, but in fact trying to make it more confident, which is a term you brought up earlier. So in fact the measure would be improved performance based on the what would it be, the language of the yeah. enacting legislation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, so my point is I'm not sure how I would distinguish that, your description of that from the sense that NEPA has been, the interpretation of NEPA has become more conservative or its implementation has become more conservative away from the statutory intent that was there. And so a Democratic president wants to still move policy back to NEPA's sort of original motivation. You could imagine another president moving it even in a more liberal direction, using that statutory authority to be even more aggressive in enforcement actions or expanding the scope of NEPA to, yeah. to cover that. And but, but the anchor then becomes uh, statutory intent, not politicization or anything else. Yeah, I guess I have a sense, my sense is that it's, there may not be, so I, I hesitate to say this because I'm thinking on the fly, but there is a sense in which agencies, there may be no static point for an agency, that is they're always being moved around by political direction, either coming from the president or by Congress, partly because they disagree about what the statute means um, and as a consequence it's moving around there. And so then the question you have is, is that more political influence or not? Yeah. Um, and that leaves greater confidence in delivering the original intent or the initial intent. Yeah. Let me think about that more. Thanks for bringing that up. In your research, did you find that anything about marriage pay for senior executives of service people who use as a tool to politicize the agency? Because uh, back about 15 years ago, yeah. marriage pay, for S it's only for SES was done. Um, I, I only know about merit pay what I think you know, which is, um, so there were some efforts to reinstall merit pay in the last administration, but there was some controversy about how, the, how those merit bonuses were given out, often to political appointees as opposed to the, to the civil servants. But I don't know much more, there's nothing sort of systematic in, that I know about that, how that was used. Um, in terms of political intervention into the senior executive service, the only thing that I have purchase on here is the extent to which positions that were once filled by career people get now filled by political people um, or positions that were career reserved are now opened up to, to political appointees, but not merit pay specifically, nothing systematic. Yeah. Uh, uh, your answer just uh, does point to the uniqueness of every political system, particularly the American system. Which Many people outside the United States, even in the United States, don't understand much of this at all. But my studies are with comparative systems, parliamentary systems, presidential systems, but I've noticed a global trend towards the great politicization of almost any system. And I try to ask the question to myself, why? Why is this some kind of a universal? And I came up with six or seven answers. One is, it's the nature of authority. Uh, if the kind of activities that governments do are quite different. The kind of agencies they employ are quite different. Some are highly politicized because they're heavily involved in changes of policy. And others never appear anywhere because they're very small and they at least like examining motor cars, mm -hmm. examining automobiles. I mean, there is no controversy, there is no policy sure. you carry out 
the law in front of you and perf perfectionism takes over. That's one is the nature of activity, which trends across the government. Second one I looked at was compatibility between the political careers and administrative careers. If they don't get on, the politicians change them. I mean, that, that it's, mm -hmm. you know, the careers don't have much to stand on when it comes to opposing their boss, political bosses. And that, that's in every political system. Mm -hmm. They find a way of changing them, of getting rid of them, whatever expression you want to use. That's the second one. The third one is actually uh, competence. There is difference of opinion of the competence of top public servants sure. and your political advisors. And many people, many presidents or prime ministers have doubts about both. Sure. Okay, sometimes it's And they conflate, they conflate ideology and competence, yeah. right? They think and that one person with the right political views is the only competent person in the agency because they understand how the world really works. There are people with reputations that are, you know, like you're talking about Keynes, okay, no matter what position you're going to keep in, and there are others, the quicker you get rid of them, the better because they've been asleep on the job for years and everybody really, sure. quote, notes it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, th the fourth one is uh, not just competence, but another one, conformability. How willing are they to go along? What I call the obedience factor. Even though I disagree with you, it's not my job to oppose you. Sure. That's it. I'll go along for a quiet life or, or not to shame you in public in some way. Uh, the fifth one was the public image. Okay, public image of the actors. The, uh, some administrators get tremendous public image and a bad image, and politicians the same way, and it changes all the time. Okay, and that's transparency issue. In many agencies, we actually don't know what goes on in the talk. Yeah. I mean, even though they're supposed to be accountable and the rest, we have very little say. We don't know the inner politics, and we're never going to likely to find out either. And the last one is uh, statutory limitations. Uh, how much are you bound by ministry of law? You actually can't get rid of the people whether you want to or not. It's, uh, there are laws yeah. different in each country. Sure. Uh, hey, the, uh, we're finding out in the city, for instance, how protected people really are and not protected. And sometimes <coughs> you work on assumptions that actually don't conform to the law at all. Yeah. Uh, so there are all these quite different factors. I think that there, yeah, I, I would agree that there's variation certainly across the world. I would dispute your claim that it's happening all over the place. I think it's happening in lots of places. Um, Ezra Suleiman has a great book on this from 2003, Dismantling Democratic States, where he tries to show in different countries that politicization is occurring, kind of a way in the way that this is defined. I dispute some of what he argues in that book. I would say that some of the concepts here are transportable to other contexts, and I think you've articulated some of them. One of them is, you know, when there's election changes, it's natural for the new party that takes control to be suspicious of the continuing civil service, particularly if they have worked closely with the last government. So, um, you know, whether it's Tony Blair when he takes over, increases the number of appointees, or John Howard in Australia, um, or what's going on in Japan right now, they're having this exact same debate about whether they want to increase the number of appointees in Japan because they think that the civil service is too closely tied. Yeah, so there is this sort of, you know, policy disagreement component to it, which I also would say is conflated in the how responsive are they going to be to our directions. But there seems to be a general feeling amongst politicians generally that they're losing control of government, that they haven't got their hands on all the things they want to have and they suspect that they are being the runaround is by the civil servants who think they are better and superior and know better. Yeah. And I, there are clashes. I would, the way I would characterize that is that in modern government you have to um, delegate increasing amounts of policy making authority to people who are not elected. And because there's more at stake in control, that may help explain why we're seeing more efforts to get control because there is more, you know, more substantive policy making is happening um, at that level as opposed to in parliament or on the floor of the legislature or something like that. And that might help explain a general trend worldwide. Okay. So here. Um, actually building on the idea of um, the comparative perspectives um, and some of the questions about the variability, do you think the larger theory about politicization could be applied down levels of government? And so specifically, do you think there's anything to be gained by looking at the states um, as kind of, uh, you know, at any one point in time, there's all those different things about variability in terms of turnover and party. Uh, I would say yes. I do think it's transportable to the states. And one of the nice things about the states is you get interesting 
institutional variation that really helps you figure out what's distinctive that sort of leads to sort of cross-context differences in politicization. So I would say yes. I mean, I think some of the ideas are transportable to lots of environments. Part of my original thinking about this was thinking about how to get control of a political science department. Um, I went and gave a talk and I, said, <laughs> and I said, what if we had a recalcitrant deputy chair or associate chair that didn't want to do what, you know, what we wanted them to do, what would we do in response to that and how would we work around that person? Um, and so I think it does, and you know, it doesn't have to be, I would argue, not even necessarily democracies per se, if a new king comes in and the military is residing from earlier periods, are they concerned about the loyalty of those military chiefs and their, um, you know, they want to sort of get their people in because they need loyalty there, but they're also worried about disrupting things too much and destroying the capability of the military to respond. Um, and so I think there's some of this transport. So it's perilous to generalize across different contexts. And so I haven't done that, and so I'm just sort of speaking, speculating. But I think some of the concepts do transport to other, other environments. Um, one of the questions, or one of the issues that may be a consequence of, of the actual research that you do here is essentially that it seems to me that this is sort of a recipe for always having some tendencies at a certain level of instability, right? Is if you know they're politicized, there's likelihood they're not doing their job as well as they might if they weren't so politicized. And since they're not doing their job all that well, that's a reason to politicize them, right, from the executive standpoint. Um, so just as as a random point, the mm -hmm. other question that I have for you is: Did you at any point try to break up some of these measures into sort of the heterogeneity within the agency themselves? I'll give you a reason for that. Mm -hmm. If you walk down the halls of beloved Caltrans, which is our, our version of the Federal Highway Administration, you will find some engineer in an ugly shirt and a pocket protector <coughs> and gray hair who will tell you this long, drawn out story of how Caltrans used to be a brilliant, rational agency that did wonderful mm -hmm. things and got stuff done until they hired those damn ecologists and biologists. And don't even get me started on when they hired the planners. That's when we went to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Right, and so when I was looking at some of the agencies that were over here mm -hmm. on one of your measures, it struck me that there was a lot of disciplinary homogeneity in there. Mm. NOAA, for example, are all atmospheric scientists and chemists, right? A few meteorologists, but they fight like cats and dogs, but they don't fight nearly as much as, say, agencies that have, you know, lawyers and economists in there. Yeah, so can I just clarify that point? Is the expectation that um, where there is professional variation, you might get more reporting of Idiotic political intervention. Evidence. Because that goes straight to the heart of who can claim to have evidence and who doesn't. You know, um, let me give that some thought. The anecdote that you provided suggests otherwise, because um, NOAA has a lot of political appointees. It has more than it should. Staffers are, are, are scientists, right? They're, amongst their staffers, you don't see necessarily the same level of professionals. Yeah. So if they have architects on board. Yeah. Right. So it would be something about if there is more or professional heterogeneity, it may be that political uh, types that come in take sides and exacerbate those debates in a way that it sort of creates this combustible political kind of environment. Is that a fair characterization? I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to. That's something I should I yeah, should address. I have a related question. Deal with the, uh, the unit of analysis. You are, you are at the level of the respondent. So. You don't know what the respondent is describing. If the respondent is describing one of the subunit he or she is working sure. with. So maybe there are multiple units within the, uh, the agency. Yeah, all I have is sort of an average sense. And it could be that there's quite a bit of variation inside the... the <laughs> one of the things that I've with the DOT is all the way over here on one year measures and all the way yeah. on the other. Yeah. And it's a very strange politics and transportation because everybody agrees that we should be building things. The, the politics come in in terms of conservative versus liberal is what we built. So mm -hmm. we want to, you know, one side wants to pave over everything that doesn't move quickly enough, the other side wants to build high-speed rail over everything sure. that doesn't move quickly enough. Yeah. But there's no sort of larger disagreement about what the mission is. Sure. Yeah, I do. I actually think when you get in those bigger sort of, when you have big differences between divisions and what different divisions do, there becomes a difference in clarity about what the actual agency's mission is. Mm -hmm. Right, and what constitute what becomes constituted as evidence-based policy. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I'm saying, just, yes, I, I there, are, there are cases where there's less policy disagreement about what agencies do in the sort of general political sense. Um, uh, but in those cases, I think what I would expect to see then is that executives are less likely to <coughs> then try to get control of it, per se, except maybe to improve management or make sure that people are there can distribute money the way that they want. But if there's disagreement about where to spend money on high-speed rail or on roads, that's just like liberal or conservative disagreement, it's just not measured that way. Yeah. yeah. Did you? I had, yeah, but it, two were just like methodological clarification, mm -hmm. which was similar to what she was saying is, what is the correlation between um, professionalism and these R&Ds and conservatism? Um, the other thing I didn't, I didn't get was, Career civil service people, do they move across agencies and how does... Rarely. How does I mean, they, they were intended to move across, but in <coughs> practice it turns out very few of them move from agency to agency. Okay. And the reason the proportion of professionals is in there is because there was some sense that if a respondent has a strong professional identity, mm -hmm. that they'd be more sensitive to politicizing activity just because of their professional identity, not because more was happening. And so the effort then was to include that measure in there as a way of... Um, um, you're trying to control for that possibility. But what about this like tax complexity and conservatism? How is, how is that? Good question, are they correlated with each other? Yeah. Um, so <coughs> most, well, let's see. So ones which have a high proportion of programs that are already like NASA and NSF are moderate in this characterization. Um, so they're kind of right in the middle. Um, can you just say one more sentence about why you were concerned about that? I, w I was just interested, mainly I was interested in kind of things that she was saying uh, prior was thinking about who are these, I'm not a political scientist, so I don't know too much about politics, and I was looking at, and listening to your story, and I'm glad you talked about the political science department, because I was wondering, how much is this, is this just a story of organizations? Yeah. And people trying to control organizations, and I'm thinking about people, scientists doing complex tasks, mm -hmm ideology versus evidence, their kind of autonomy from the organization and a CEO trying to harness in well, that's a great the research they want them to do. Yeah, that's a great example. So think about it like a CEO. So there's turnover in a CEO, a new CEO comes in. They have to decide, how much am I going to mess with what's going on in this corporation, bring in my own people, change the heads of divisions, and do things like that. My willingness to do it in the sales staff might be greater than my willingness to do it in the accounting staff because the people in the accounting staff, they have firm specific expertise that's really hard to get outside, whereas the sales staff, I can sort of buy new, new salespeople to do this job more easily. So I'm constrained by how my choices would affect those divisions within the corporation. Um, but I need to get this corporation to do what I want because I'm going to be held accountable for, for earnings. And so I better do it. But they're making that same kind of a choice, which suggests that there is some of a just organizational component to it as you yeah. Suggest it. But yeah, are the, the NASA's, the um, DOE, are they just more conservative? So does it really matter compared to, you know? I yeah, I don't know what the correlation is. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good point. I tried, you know, hopefully with controlling account for allow these things to be estimated separately, but I, it's an imperfect measure in both cases. Yeah, because you just have two mm -hmm. different things measuring. David, would you like I can ask. No. Okay. Well, anyway, um, we can wrap up there. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks for your comments. I appreciate it.